Um, so basically, what's going on here? We've seen an increase in great white shark sightings in Southern California. Yeah, so we have been seeing an increase in great white shark sightings in Southern California, and that's quite simply because there's more great whites. White sharks were protected in California in 1994, and their food source have recovered. So as a result, we're starting to see more sharks. The population is recovering, and that's a good sign. Has um, in recent years we've seen an uptick in sightings down here in San Diego County. Has, has San Diego kind of popped up on the radar as being one of the, one of the more of the hot spots? So what we've learned about juvenile white sharks, and, and we mainly have juvenile white sharks along our beaches, is that they have hotspot nursery areas that vary from year to year throughout Southern California. And what's really interesting was about 10 years ago, when we first started to see them pop up, they were primarily around Santa Monica Bay, Santa Barbara, Long Beach, Huntington Beach, and we had none off San Diego. And starting about two years ago, we started seeing juvenile white sharks down in San Diego County. And now that's one of our biggest hotspots. And so uh, what, what do you think is going on there? What, what, what should people know um, as far as uh, why what's what's making San Diego County a, a place of choice? Well, that's something we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out what makes a hotspot a hotspot. So in 2018, we received funding from the state of California to fund the the shark beach safety program. And, and that was mainly because there was concern about public using these waters or sharing them with these juvenile white sharks that are using our beaches as nurseries. So the question is, what makes a good nursery a nursery? Is it about water temperature? Is it about food? Why are they there? So one of the reasons why we think they select a site is because it's safe. That's what makes a good nursery a nursery. And people don't often think of a, a five foot white shark as being afraid of anything, but they are. So they're born, they're given no parental care. They're completely on their own. And we think the reason why they choose shallow water along beaches is it's a safe place for them. The other reason is the water's warm and they can grow faster. The water's warmer right along the shoreline. So that helps them grow. And then if they're gonna spend weeks to months, which we see them doing at these sites, they have to be eating something. So what are they eating? The number one thing we find in, in juvenile white shark stomachs are stingrays. And we have hundreds of thousands of those along our coast. So those are the reasons why we think they choose certain beaches as nurseries. Hey, thanks for walking me through that. When you said the shark, you said the shark beat safety program, or what was that again? So the California Shark Beach Safety Program was funded in 2018 through the California State Legislature as a way of providing lifeguards who are responsible for keeping people safe when they're at the beach more information so they could better decide how to manage a beach if white sharks were present there. So as you can imagine, if a white shark is sighted off a beach and the lifeguards had to close the beach just because a white shark is there and that shark didn't pose a risk to the public, that would put an economic burden on that community for no good reason. So our research is really focused on understanding why the sharks are there, and more importantly, do they pose a risk to people? So let's get into that. What is there a risk? So one of the studies that we've been doing is we've been tagging juvenile white sharks with acoustic transmitters for the last 10 years and tracking their movements. We have almost 200 sharks out there that we've been monitoring. We have acoustic receivers all along our coastline that are constantly listening for these tagged sharks. And one of the things we found is that sharks will use these nursery habitats pretty consistently for weeks to months, forming these small aggregations, up to 40 sharks. And then for some reason, they will shift and move to another beach. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So water temperature appears to be an important cue that influences that. The other part could be food. And we're doing a, a diet study right now to try to figure out what are they eating when they're at those beaches and how much food is at the beach? And does that dictate whether they'll stay or not? But the study that we've done that we just completed to look at when sharks and people interact is a drone study. So I have a graduate student, Patrick Rex, that has flown drones all along Southern California beaches for the last two years to count how many people are in the water what are they doing? Are they surfing, swimming, stand up paddleboarding, waiting? And when are they in close proximity to sharks? And do the sharks behave differently when people are around? So he's just completed some of those analyses. And basically, not surprisingly, when we have a hot spot, a shark hot spot, 
there can be hundreds of thousands of people that use those beaches throughout the summer, and those people and sharks are together at the same time. The other analysis that he's found, and he's not quite through with all that, is that basically sharks treat people as flotsam. So they're floating on the surface, and as long as people aren't chasing the sharks, the sharks by and large ignore the people. You said sharks treat people as, what was the term you used? Uh, they treat people like flotsam, just floating objects on the surface. So most surfers, you know, stand up paddle boarders, they're all surface oriented, even the swimmers. But the sharks are down below. Quite often they cannot see the sharks that swim underneath them because the visibility is not good. But we can easily see them from the air. So our analysis shows that on a daily basis, people and white sharks are interacting all throughout Southern California, but yet we don't hear about people being bitten. So what this tells us is that there is a relatively low risk of people being injured by those juvenile white sharks that are using our, our popular beaches as their nursery. And, um, <clears throat> okay, and uh, so got that. And then, um, oh, so tell me what makes a juvenile What's the definition of a juvenile shark, uh, size-wise, age-wise, and then at what point do they become not a juvenile? So a juvenile white shark is any shark between five, four and a half feet long up to about nine feet long. Those are still considered juveniles. And the behavior that we see from newborns, those are sharks born this spring, you know, basically they'll use these beaches cruising back and forth along a stretch of beach for weeks to months at a time. And then they'll migrate, typically in the winter, they would migrate south to Baja. The last few winters haven't been that cold. And we found that some of the sharks have overwintered. In addition, the ones that have migrated to Baja quite often come back the following spring and they exhibit that exact same behavior up until they're about nine feet long. So what's really interesting is now we have these nurseries with newborns up to probably about six-year-old sharks. And they're basically using the beaches still as a nursery. Interesting. Okay, so they go up to about six years old being a juvenile. How, how old could do, do adults typically get for their life cycle? So we think that males probably mature around 12 feet long, nine to anywhere between 10 and, and 12 feet long. Females mature after 12 feet. And basically, that's probably anywhere between 10 to 14 years old for males. And for females, that's anywhere from 14 to 18 years old. So unfortunately, we don't have really good data on that. But what we do know is that white sharks can live to be up to 70 years old. Wow. OK. Um, let's see here. Um, what, maybe you can help guide me here. What, what are some other interesting things about this whole thing uh, that, that I'm missing here. So one of the things that we found that I find really interesting is that we will find these nurseries at places where they're really popular beach like Santa Monica, where there are tens of thousands of people in the water every day, or even more remote beaches that, that have very few people. So it doesn't look like people influence the behavior of the sharks. And one of our other really interesting questions, because sharks are interacting with people daily, are they actually learning what people are? And therefore, will that lower their chances of mistaking a human for food as they grow? And that, I think, would be a very interesting question. So now that we have these sharks tagged, we can ask how much time have they spent at a nursery with lots of people? And if we detect those sharks at other locations, especially maybe one where a bite has occurred, can we then correlate that to some learning experience or non-learning experience? Interesting. Um, let's see, oh, uh, so the um, what the the shark shark nesting. Um, you're saying so you're giving me this idea that the nursery they're using these nurseries. Uh, um, is that the same thing as a nesting site, or is that when a, a female's giving birth? Um, and what is there a time of year when that's happening? So we start seeing newborn white sharks off our beaches starting around April, and that will go through probably till about July, which is the peak. We don't exactly know where females give birth, but we don't think female white sharks give birth on our beaches because somebody would see it. We have the most aerial covered habitat in the world between helicopters and planes and female, female white sharks, you know, they're 14 to 18 feet long. So these are big sharks. 
So we think that they might be giving birth maybe on deeper water out in the channels between the islands. And then those young sharks swim to the beach because it's warm and safe. So the, right now, that's what we think makes good nursery habitat is shallow protected water, warm water, and water with lots of easy to capture food like stingrays. And um, moving forward here, what's, what's on the horizon? So our, our next step is to really get to the point where we think we can start making shark forecasts. In other words, can we predict where sharks are going to show up? And then maybe someday on the television news while you're watching the weather and you're learning about rip currents that day because big tides and wind, maybe one day there'll be stingray reports or there'll be white shark reports. And that will be based on the things that we've learned about the behavior of those two animals to help keep people safe when they go to the beach. Cool. Um, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground, but is there some elements here that I'm missing that, I, that we haven't talked about? So probably one of the most important parts of our program is our, our collaborative efforts working with all the ocean lifeguards in California. They're, they're on the front lines, they're dealing with the public, and they're also dealing with sharks when they're at these beaches. So they're our research partners. So they help us with a lot of this work and we could not do it without their help. The other part is our education program. We have a very large education and outreach program where we use our current science and get that information out to the public because we think it's really important that the public understand more about these sharks and by doing so, takes away some of the fear about hearing that they're there and some of the worry about worrying about the fact that there might be white sharks at their beach, reassuring them that the probability of being injured is actually pretty low. Gotcha. Um, is there a website uh, where, where this, the, the program you're talking about and all that um, and uh, anything like that is accessible? Sure. We're, we're on social media. You can just uh, search for CSULB Shark Lab or you can search out the CSULB Shark Lab website. And we have lots of information about our white shark program as well as a lot of our educational materials. Oh, okay. So uh, it's, 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 uh, you're part of this thing called the Shark Lab? And that's it's, it's Cal California State Long Beach? Yes, the California State University Long Beach Shark Lab has been around since 1969. It's one of the oldest shark research labs in the country. So we've been focusing on understanding the behavior of sharks and fisheries and things like that. But this program is really focused uh, on, on helping people understand what white sharks are doing along our coast and how population increase is actually a good thing for California. If uh uh, oh, um, oh, yeah, yeah. So you, you were mentioning um, that there, a protection went into place in 1994, um, and that, that uh, the numbers have come back since then. Um, I think you touched on that like early on. Yep. Yeah. Um, are there pictures on the website or social media of of the Shark Lab and things like that that I'd be able to use? Absolutely. So we have lots of photos. Um, there's there's a whole history of the Shark Lab that you can see. In addition, we have lots of B-roll and we're happy to share any of that with you. Um, but basically that information is made available so that the public can understand what we're doing and why it's important. And of course, the fact that white shark populations uh, were in trouble a hundred years ago due to overfishing and things like that. Um, protection was important to help bring them back, but it wasn't just protection from fisheries that has enabled the white shark population to recover. It's been recovery of adult white shark food sources. So marine mammals, seals, sea lions were hunted at the verge of extinction by the early 1900s and have made remarkable recoveries because of protections. So in my opinion, these are all great signs of California's impressive conservation efforts to bring some of these populations back, actually show a healthier coastal ocean than what we've seen in the past.